good afternoon to those of you who have uh, tuned in for our discussion this afternoon about twisted hearts. So what I want to talk to you about is what used to be called complex congenital malformations. And any of you who have been around for any time will know that the solution to the analysis of what we used to call complex cardiac malformations, and that's a long time ago now, before, most, before all of you were born, I'm sure, was segmental analysis. And I'm sure you're all also aware that segmental analysis to the congenitally malformed heart was introduced by Richard and Stella van Prague. Now here's a nice picture of Richard and Stella. Sadly, Stella van Prague is no longer with us. She died quite some time ago now, but Richard is still active. He still pops in and he works in the archive that he set up at Boston Children's Hospital. And Richard really was the king of the congenitally malformed heart when I started in this field. And me starting in the field goes quite some time ago now. It was in 1974 when I moved down from Manchester, where I had previously been as a, an assistant lecturer in anatomy. And I had the opportunity at that time to come down to the Brompton Hospital. It wasn't even the Royal Brompton at that time. And I was able to be a clinical cardiac anatomist. And what I want to talk to you today regards what we might think of the schism that subsequently arose between the way that Dr. Van Prague wanted to look at the congenitally malformed heart and the way that we wanted to look at the congenitally malformed heart when we produced the system which is now well known. Uh, Miana tells me that I'm talking to most of the fellows at Great Ormond Street but I also gather that uh, the program is broadcast to those who wish to uh, tune into it. And some of you might be listening from the USA, she tells me. Also, we have people who tune in from Africa, from also all over Europe. So many of you will know that we diverged a little bit when we developed our own approach in the latter part of the 1970s, and we called that sequential segmental analysis. And I was quite surprised at the time when we introduced uh, what we thought were minor modifications of the segmental approach that Dr. Van Prague was not entirely happy at the way he saw us dealing with his approach. And there's no question that we all thought his approach was fantastic. We thought that his approach brought clarity to what previously had been opaque, but we felt that his approach, which had been developed prior to the advent of cross-sectional echocardiography, with cross-sectional echocardiography coming in, we felt that for the first time in the clinical situation, clinicians such as yourselves were able precisely to see how the segments were joined one to the other. And that's why we called our modification sequential segmental analysis. And we were surprised that our approach invoked what I've already introduced as the schism. And so there was divergence in the way that Dr. Van Prague developed his own system, the way that we developed our system. And for better or worse, Dr. Van Prague was very unhappy with what we wanted to call connections. And any of you who follow the current literature will know that in many of the centers that still take the Van Praguean approach to nomenclature, particularly the center in Philadelphia, headed by Paul Weinberg, who is perhaps Van Prague's major disciple, they have introduced a new way of describing the way the segments are connected one to the other. They don't use the term connections. In fact, they talk of alignments. And to me, that is a big problem. And what I'm going to try to discuss with you today 
is the problem is that I see the difference between connections and alignments because I do not think that alignments are the same things as connections. And I'm going to show you how if we concentrate on connections, but then we also look at how segments can be malaligned even when they are connected together, that we can resolve the schism that unfortunately developed between the way we look at things, which we still think of as the European approach, although that now has been adopted worldwide, but there are still those who prefer to use the Van Kragen approach. So ideally, it would be nice if we could combine the two. So what I'm going to try to do in the time I have available today is to look at some very complex hearts. I hope you're going to be able to follow the way I describe these hearts. And I'm going to use these complex malformations to show you how we can bridge the gap between what we still think of as connections and what Dr. Van Prague and his colleagues think of as alignments. So the real question is, do the atrial chambers connect one to the other? And then when we come back to segmental analysis, I'm going to pose the question for you, are the segments always in harmony? Because what I'm going to show you is that for Dr. Van Prague, the essence of alignments is segmental harmony. So let me share this picture with you. Hopefully you will all recognize that I'm showing what we call the four chamber cut. It's a four chamber cut across the normal heart. And I'm concentrating on the atrioventricular junctions. And you will all recognize, I hope, that here we have the morphologically right atrium. I hope you can see my pointer. There is the opening of the inferior cable vein and the floor of the morphologically right atrium. And here we have the morphologically left atrium. The key point is the atrioventricular junction. And at the atrioventricular junction, as I've shown with the arrows, the fibroadipose tissue of the atrioventricular grooves interposes between the atrial walls and the crest of the ventricular mass. And that is necessary, of course, to produce electrical insulation because in the normal heart, it is only in the septal component, where I'm showing you again, hopefully you can see my arrow, where the atrioventricular junction axis connects the atrial myocardium to the ventricular myocardium. So the key to sequential segmental analysis is not only to analyze the segments, but also to look at how they are joined together across the junctions. And what we're going to be discussing today is the two junctions, the atrioventricular junctions and the ventricular arterial junctions. And what we have to concentrate upon is the cavities, because you are all clinicians, and the key to what you are trying to do as you diagnose and treat patients with congenital heart disease is to understand how the blood goes round. And I hope you will all agree with me. But in the normal heart, there's no question but that the blood from the right atrium crosses the right atrioventricular junction and enters the right ventricle. The blood from the left atrium crosses the left atrioventricular junction and enters the morphologically left ventricle. So the cavities of the chambers are connected together. And you see this all the time with echocardiography. You can now see it with computed tomography. You can see it with magnetic resonance imaging. And all the techniques you now have at your fingertips tell you unequivocally that the cavities of the atrial and ventricular chambers are in communic communication one with the other. But does it mean the chambers that are aligned one to the other are necessarily be connected? Because any of you who are students of nomenclature, as I've already intimated, will know that nowadays Dr. Van Prague doesn't talk about connections, he talks about 
alignments. So here is another heart that I'd like you to consider. This is classical tricuspid atresia. And there you see the right atrium. Note that here we have the delimiting coronary arteries and the delimiting coronary arteries are showing you the confines of the morphologically right ventricle. So there is the right atrioventricular junction. And you will all appreciate, I hope, that the essence of classical tricuspid atresia is absence of the right atrioventricular connection. But to me, this is the problem with alignments. Because unequivocally in this heart, the right atrial chamber is aligned with the right ventricular chamber, but because of the absence of the right atrioventricular connection, the cavity of the right atrium is no longer connected to the cavity of the right ventricle. So connections and alignments, despite what Dr. Van Prague and Dr. Weinberg might try to tell you, if you use the words in their vernacular meaning, and all the time I try to use words so that they are meaningful to what in London we call the man on the Clapham omnibus, connections and alignments are not describing the same feature. So why did we come to the situation where we had this schism between the way that we were trying to do things with my colleagues, not only in Europe, also in Canada. I worked very closely with the late lamented Robert Frieden. I spent quite some time working with other colleagues now in the United States. And in fact, two of the people who I work most closely with, Andrew Reddington, Dan Penny, they now head up programs in the United States. So why did we have this schism? And it all comes down to the word concordance. Because when we started in the 1970s to talk about sequential segmental analysis, we used the word atrioventricular concordance. And this is what we meant. I'm showing you here two arrangements of hearts with biventricular atrioventricular connections. On the left hand, you see usual atrial arrangements, situs solitus, if you will. And in usual atrial arrangement, when we have right handed ventricular topology, the right atrium connects to the right ventricle, the left atrium connects to the left ventricle. To your right hand, you see exactly the same thing in mirror imaged arrangement. And in total mirror imagery, what many of you, I'm sure, still call situs inversus. Not only are the atrial chambers mirror imaged, the ventricles are also mirror imaged, giving us the arrangement we can call left-handed ventricular topology. But because the atrial chambers and the ventricular chambers are both mirror imaged, the blood still goes the right way round. And for better and worse, when we wrote our first papers of what we wanted to call sequential segmental analysis in the mid 1970s, we called this atrioventricular concordance. But what we had failed to appreciate was that in Van Prague in terminology, as we see here, situs solitus, S, right-handed ventricular, topology, a T bulboventricular loop. We thought that this was what Dr. Van Prague called atrioventricular concordance. And it is indeed what he calls atrioventricular concordance. What we hadn't appreciated at the time, however, that if you have a combination that looks like this, Again, we have situs solitus, S, the atrial chambers are where you expect them to be. But in the diagram I'm showing you at the moment, both atrioventricular junctions join the dominant morphologically left ventricle. We have double inlet left ventricle. And in the picture I'm showing you the incomplete right ventricle 
what Dr. Van Praag calls the infundibular outlet chamber is right-sided. And because the infundibular outlet chamber is right-sided, there is presumed again to be rightward ventricular topology, D bulbo ventricular looping. And unfortunately, what we had not appreciated at the time was that for both of these combinations, Dr. Van Praag wanted to use the term atrioventricular concordance, whereas in our first papers, we wanted to call this variant that you see to your left hand atrioventricular concordance, whereas we wanted to call the variant you see to your right hand double inlet ventricle. And we wanted to distinguish the two, whereas for Dr. Van Praag, they were one and the same. They had atrioventricular concordance because in Van Praagian terminology, if you have SD, cytosolitis with D bulbar ventricular loop, or if you have IL inversus with L bulbar ventricular loop, then irrespective of what is going on across the atrioventricular junctions, you have atrioventricular concordance. And similarly, if you have SL, or if you have ID, you have atrioventricular discordance, again, irrespective of what is going on across the atrioventricular junctions. So in other words, Dr. Van Praag is presuming by the presence of SD, or SL, meaning what we at the time called atrioventricular concordance or atrioventricular discordance, he is presuming that there is always going to be segmental harmony. But is that indeed the case? Well, in most instances it is, and this is where we come to what we might think of as complex cardiac malformations because one of the essences of complexity is abnormal relationships of chambers which might be properly joined together but abnormally related. And that can occur for two reasons. You can have tilting of the ventricular mass, so giving us supra-inferior ventricles. You can have rotation of the ventricular mass, and it is rotation of the ventricular mass that potentially gives you problems because that produces what we now call the crisscross heart. So here we see the essence of tilting of the ventricular mass. It's particularly seen in the setting of congenitally corrected transposition. I'm showing you here a picture of a heart that has congenitally corrected transposition, the right atrium next to the morphologically left ventricle, which pumps its blood into the pulmonary trunk. We have discordant connections at both atrioventricular and ventricular arterial levels. So the pulmonary trunk pumps its blood back to the right, left atrium, into the right ventricle, and then into the aorta. The blood is going the right way round, despite the fact that we have two sets of discordant connections. Oftentimes, in congenitally corrected transposition, the ventricular mass is in the midline but you can tilt up the ventricular mass and usually it tilts up in such a way that the morphologically left ventricle is on the top, morphologically right ventricle is at the bottom. Oftentimes then the heart occupies a right-sided position within the chest, but the tilting of the ventricular mass with the new supra-inferior ventricles, the fact that the heart might be in the right chest, even though there's usual atrial arrangement, that does not alter the segmental connections. And many might call that supra-inferior ventricles, but it's still congenitally corrected transposition. It's a little more complex when you twist the ventricular mass. So here I am, I'm back to that picture I showed you, showing you regular congenitally corrected transposition. But now if we tilt the ventricular mass, the morphologically right ventricle comes anterior and oftentimes it becomes right-sided 
despite the fact we have congenitally corrected transposition with usual atrial arrangement. And the essence of the crisscross heart is twisting of the atrioventricular connections. And nowadays, in fact, we call this arrangement twisted atrioventricular connections. I worked with Shi Jun Yu from Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto. Shi Jun was still in Korea at Su when he pointed out to me that the crisscross heart was better considered in terms of twisted atrioventricular connections. And that is certainly the case. So in the setting of twisted atrioventricular connections, we have the situation that despite the fact we have congenitally corrected transposition, and you will all be well aware that many people think of congenitally corrected transposition as L transposition. When we have twisted atrioventricular connections, despite the fact that we have congenitally corrected transposition, the usual atrial arrangement, the aorta can be right-sided. So this is no longer L transposition, and that's why you should not use L transposition as though synonymous with congenitally corrected transposition. And if you are Van Pragian, and if you are a pure Van Pragian, you should now be calling this transposition SLD. The L telling you that you have left-handed ventricular topology with usual arrangement, and the D telling you that despite the fact that you have congenitally corrected transposition, you do have a right-sided aorta. So here we are again, this is congenitally corrected transposition, just to reinforce for you what's going on in congenitally corrected transposition. I'm showing you the picture of the typical ventricular mass, and you all know that to introduce I hope, or at least I say you all know, I hope you all know that we determine ventricular topology by placing the palmar surface of our hands on the septal surface of the morphologically right ventricle, such that your thumb goes into the tricuspid valve and your fingers go up the outflow tract, in this instance, the outflow tract supporting the aorta. So there we have the morphologically right ventricle. You should all now be trying to put your hands on this septal surface. And I hope that like me, you can only get your left hand on the septal surface, the morphologically right ventricle, which is left-sided in the setting of congenitally corrected transposition. And this of course is the essence of left-handed ventricular topology. And you will then appreciate, I hope, that when we have congenitally corrected transposition with twisted atrioventricular connections, despite the fact the morphologically right ventricle may now be right-sided due to the twisting of the ventricular mass, it is still the left hand that goes on the septal surface of the morphologically right ventricle. So twisting the ventricular mass when we have the segmental connections giving us genetically corrected transposition does not alter the ventricular topology. We still have segmental harmony. Repeat, twisting or tilting does not disturb the segmental connections. But are the segments always in harmony? Because the essence of the Van Pragian approach to terminology is that by describing the segmental arrangement, you can infer what is going on in terms of what Dr. Van Prague and Dr. Weinberg call alignments. So if you have transposition SD, then you have regular transposition. If you have transposition SL, you have congenitally corrected transposition. The system depends upon the presence of segmental harmony. But are the segments always in harmony? So let me show you a very interesting heart. This is a heart that we came across when I was still working with my colleagues up in Liverpool. This was in the archive that was housed at uh, 
initially at the Royal Liverpool Children's Hospital in Myrtle Street. The archive was then moved to Alder Hay. They still have a limited number of hearts, but you probably know that there were problems with the archive in Liverpool, so I don't even know whether this heart exists anymore. But what you are looking at is the anteriorly located right ventricle in a complexly malformed heart. And you can see that there is a valve coming into this ventricle. That valve is the morphologically tricuspid valve. I'll take my hand away for just a moment. Because you can also see that arising from this ventricle, we have both of the arterial trunks. And if you look carefully to the top left hand corner of the panel, you can see the aorta. There you see a coronary artery that is rising from the aorta. You can see that both of the arterial roots are supported by infundibulums. We have double outlet right ventricle. And then, as I say, when you try to put your hand on the septal surface of this right ventricle, you have left handed ventricular topology. Now, to all intents and purposes, you would then imagine that this is just like the ventricle I showed you a moment ago. It's the morphologically right ventricle in a patient with discordant atrioventricular connections. But there lies the rub. Because here now I've turned the heart round and you're looking at it from behind. And that pink thing that you see is a probe that I've now placed through the tricuspid valve into the atrium supporting that morphologically tricuspid valve. And now from the back, there is the probe from the right ventricle and you can see that he's going up into the right atrium and the right atrium is indeed right sided. We have usual atrial arrangement. So there is the left atrium and the left atrium is expelling its blood through the morphologically mitral valve into an excessively trabeculated left ventricle. So left atrium to left ventricle, right atrium to right ventricle, we have concordant atrioventricular connections. But now let me take you back to the morphologically right ventricle. Remember, this is a concordantly connected right ventricle in the setting of usual atrial arrangement. And almost without exception, when you have usual atrial arrangement, concordant atrioventricular connections, you expect to find right-handed ventricular topology. Tricuspid valve from the right vent atrium, morphologically right ventricle, double outlet with left-handed ventricular topology. So this is one of those very rare cases that have segmental disharmony. So if you were describing this with Van Pragian terminology, it would be SD and then D double outlet right ventricle. And you would presume that there were discordant atrioventricular mm -hmm. connections, but in fact, there are concordant atrioventricular connections. But for us using connections, it doesn't matter because simply, we can simply say we have usual atrial arrangement, concordant atrioventricular actions with left handed topology. So if we account for segmental anatomy, we then account for atrioventricular connections, we take away the ambiguity. So how frequent is segmental disharmony, which is what I've just shown you. And in fact, it is as rare as hen's teeth. And here is a heart that I discussed at great length with another of the colleagues with now I, whom I work very closely, and that is Saurabh Gupta. Saurabh and I have become very close collaborators and this is one of the hearts that he described quite some time ago with yet another of my colleagues, you see, Xu Yen Ho, who worked with me for very many years at the Royal Brompton, is still active at the Royal Brompton. And this is a heart that they described 2014 
in the World Journal of Pediatric and Genital Heart Surgery with what they called isolated atrial inversion. And here we are back to twisted hearts. But I disagree with them on their interpretation of this heart. And it shows again why we need to analyze the segments separately from the way they are joined together. So let me show you what's going on in this very interesting heart that they describe. You will all recognize here that I'm showing you bronchial morphology. You all know, I trust, that the left bronchus is long, the right bronchus is short. So unequivocally, you hear from this beautiful picture of the bronchial tree, you see we have usual bronchial arrangement. But here is the arrangement at the atrioventricular the connections. And they put labels on very nicely so that you can see what's going on. You're looking at the ventricular mass from beneath. So the right side of the patient is to your left hand. The left side is to your right hand. And what you see is the inferior cable vein coming up, entering the right atrium. But the right atrial appendage is left-sided. The right atrial appendage is crossing to enter the, the, the morphologically right atrium is left sided. Did I say right sided? I should have said left sided. The blood from the morphologically right atrium is crossing over to the right sided morphologically right ventricle. So there I put some markers again. The morphologically right atrial appendage, left side. The morphologically right ventricle is right sided and the blood is concordantly connected as it's going from right atrium to the right-sided right ventricle. So we have concordant atrioventricular connections. So we have mirror-imaged atrial arrangement with concordant atrioventricular connections. In other words, we would expect to be finding left-handed ventricular topology. Another of their pictures, we see that the left atrium is indeed right-sided. Once more, you're looking at it. I've put on the markers there from beneath. The morphologically left ventricle is left-sided. There is the morphologically right atrium. And again, we have concordant atrioventricular connections. But now the picture also shows you that the morphologically left ventricle is expelling its blood into the aorta. We have concordant ventricular arterial connections. So when we describe segmental arrangement, the thoracoabdominal organs are usually arranged. I showed you the bronchial tree. However, the atrial chambers are mirror imaged. We have thoracoatrial discordance, but we have concordant atrioventricular and ventricular arterial connections with mirror imaged atrial arrangement we would expect there to be left-handed ventricular topology. So let's now look at ventricular topology and we can work that out also from the images they provided. So here we're looking at what's going on in the frontal projection. The catheter is coming up the right-sided inferior cable vein and it crosses over to enter the left-sided morphologically right atrium. The catheter then passes into the right ventricle through the left-sided tricuspid valve, and it exits through the pulmonary trunk. So again, concordant atrioventricular connections, concordant ventricular arterial connections. If we look now at the septal surface, we can look at that by another of their pictures where show, they've shown us the left lateral view of that same catheter course. So we know that the catheter is going through the inlet of the right ventricle. It's entering the apical trabecular component of the right ventricle, and it's expelling its blood through the outlet of the right ventricle. And now from the left side, we can put the palmar surface of our hands on the septal surface of this morphologically right ventricle. And I hope you will all agree that what we will have in this particular heart is left-handed topology. And that's exactly what we would find in a heart that has usual atrial arrangement 
in the sorry, I take the, a heart that has mirror imaged atrial arrangement with concordant atrioventricular connections. And it also has twisted atrioventricular connections. And here is that picture that is showing the twisted atrioventricular connections. The right sided morphologically left atrium is expelling its blood through the mitral valve into the left sided morphologically left ventricle. The morphologically right atrium on the left side is expelling its blood through the tricuspid valve into the right sided morphologically right ventricle. So we have a perfect example here of a heart with concordant atrioventricular connections in the setting of mirror imaged arrangement with twisted atrioventricular connections. Once more, because we have twisting of the atrioventricular connections, that has not disturbed the segmental harmony. We still have left-handed ventricular topology. So if I describe the situation sequentially, we have thoracoabdominal atrial discordance, we have segmental harmony. But the, at the time that my colleagues first described this, they were suggesting that the concordant ventricular arterial connections were normally related. But what are normal relations for left-handed ventricular topology with concordant ventricular arterial connections? And self-evidently, because we are dealing with a situation where we have mirror imagery, twisting atrioventricular connections, we would expect the mirror image pattern, but the twisting would simply increase the spiraling of the arterial trunks. So what is the mirror imaged arrangement at the ventriculo arterial junction? Now this is the picture of a normal heart. It's one of the exquisite images that are produced these days by another of my very good friends and collaborators, Diane Spicer. She's from Florida. She's working at the University of Florida in Gainesville. This is in fact a picture she took from her own archive, which is in Tampa. And there is the right-sided aorta, which is in continuity with the left-sided mitral valve. And in the setting of normal spiraling arterial trunk, the left-sided pulmonary trunk bifurcates to the left of the aorta. So this is what the whole thing would look like if we mirror imaged it. It's not a different heart. All I've done is mirror image the picture I showed you just a moment ago. So mirror image normal arrangements have the aorta in the left-sided position, continuity with the right-sided mitral valve. Now, because we have mirror imagery, the pulmonary trunk is right-sided and is bifurcating to the right of the aorta. So let's look again at the Indian case, because we know that in this particular case, the aorta was to the right and posterior. So the left-sided pulmonary trunk is bifurcating not to the right as it would if it was mirror imaged, but in fact, it's bifurcating to the left. So we do not have mirror imaged arterial arrangements. The abnormal ventricular arterial relationships are because of the twisting, but they are not normal relations. They are twisting of initially parallel arterial trunks. So in fact, the patient does not have isolated atrial inversion with segmental disharmony, but instead, has discordance between what's going on at the atrial level and the rest of the thoracoabdominal organs. And this introduces yet another important point. When now we are conducting sequential segmental analysis, we have to analyze each of the system of organs in isolation. And if we describe that, we take away any ambiguity. So their case is a lovely case of twisted concordant atrioventricular and ventricular arterial connections, but initially with parallel arterial trunks. So this is one of those hearts, had it not been twisted, that you might want to call with one of these amazingly difficult entities. 
anatomically corrected malposition, isolated ventricular inversion, isolated what have you. The Indians and in Indian colleagues initially wanted to call it isolated atrial inversion. But these arcane terms produce nothing but confusion. And that's what I'm hoping to discuss with you today. We can take away all this confusion simply by describing what we see. So what I'd like to finish talking to you about is how we can make sense of these other alleged complex lesions simply by describing concordant ventricular arterial connections, but with parallel rather than spiraling arterial trunks. This is the way Dr. Van Prague likes to talk about it. He takes these parts out. I find this far too complicated because in reality, if we take apart what's happening at the ventricular arterial junctions, and we simply think of connections, relations, infundibular morphology, once we recognize that these are independent features of the heart, we can take away all that complication and take away the room for confusion. So let me take you back to the normal situation, which the aorta is posterior to the right, and we have spiraling arterial trunks, and we have a subpulmonary infundibulum. On the other side of the heart, in normal relations, the aorta is posterior to the right, we have a left-sided mitral valve, and we have fibrous continuity between the leaflets of the aortic and mitral valves. Now here is a key point of normal development. Since my alleged retirement, I've been doing quite some work on the way the heart develops. And we know that in the mouse heart, as the interventricular closes on day 14.5, this is what it looks like simulating the parasternal echocardiographic cut. The aortic valve is in the right ventricle, but there is discontinuity between the aortic valve and the mitral valve. There is a subaortic infundibulum. And in fact, we've also known for quite some time that even some normal hearts have discontinuity between the leaflets of the aortic and mitral valves in the setting of an otherwise normal arrangement. So this is a paper from 1976 that showed that a subaortic conus or infundibulum can sometimes be found in the otherwise normal heart. Now this is a heart that has a subaortic conus or infundibulum. I'm showing it to you from the right ventricle. The right ventricle is supporting the pulmonary trunk. At first sight, which has an infundibulum, at first sight the right ventricle is also supporting the aorta. And what you see is the aorta and the pulmonary trunk are arising side by side. There is usual atrial arrangement, there's right-handed ventricular topology, but the aorta is left-sided. But what you also note here is that there is discontinuity in the root of the aorta between the outlet septum and the anterior wall of the right ventricle. And in fact, when we put all of that together, we see that what is really happening in this heart is that the morphologically left ventricle is supporting the aorta. The aorta has an infundibulum, but the aorta is not spiraling as it exits from the ventricular mass. So this is concordant ventricular arterial connections with parallel arterial trunks. And many will call this anatomically corrected malposition. I don't think that helps particularly much if we say there are concordant ventricular arterial connections with parallel arterial trunks, subaortic infundibulum, there you see the subaortic infundibulum, sequential segmental description, usual atrial arrangement, concordant atrioventricular and ventricular arterial connections, parallel trunks, bilateral infundibulums, mid-muscular ventricular septal defect, you've said it all. You have removed any potential confusion by describing what is going on. And I'd like to complete my talk to you about twisted hearts, twisted confusion, confusion where we're looking for clarification by showing you 
this heart. Now this heart is one from the archive of what used to be Chicago Children's Memorial Hospital, it's now Lurie Children's Hospital. And I've worked now for many years in this archive. And the first time I saw this heart, I looked at it and I saw there was a mitral valve, take my word for it, that there is usual H arrangement. So this mitral valve is bringing the blood from the morphologically right atrium. And the valves go with their ventricles. So that tells you that this is a morphologically left ventricle. And to all intents and purposes, when I looked at this heart for several years, I thought it was regular congenitally corrected transposition because I thought that was the pulmonary trunk. But let's look at that arterial root in a little more detail. So this is the same heart. These are the pictures taken by Diane Spicer again. She's helped me looking at this heart. We're now looking at that arterial root from above. And in fact, the arterial root gives rise to the morphologically right coronary artery and to the morphologically left coronary artery. It is not the pulmonary trunk, it is the aorta. There is the pulmonary trunk. And when we turn round the heart, so we're looking at it now from the left side, the tricuspid valve is coming from the morphologically left atrium into the morphologically right ventricle. We have discordant atrioventricular connections, but arising from the morphologically right ventricle is the pulmonary trunk. We have discordant atrioventricular connections, concordant ventricular arterial connections. The blood is going around to produce the picture of regular transposition. We have a subpulmonary infundibulum. We have left-handed ventricular topology which is what we expect with discordant atrioventricular connections. And now when we revert and we look now at the morphologically left ventricle, which is receiving a mitral valve giving rise to the aorta, you will now appreciate that there is a subaortic infundibulum. But that doesn't really matter because we have concordant ventricular arterial connections with discordant atrioventricular connections. So the blood, as I say, is going to give you the picture of regular transversion because we have concordant connection at one connect junction, discordant at the other. The key point, we have parallel arterial trunks with bilateral infundibulums. So I've introduced you to a lot of complexity today. I hope I've not confused you totally. So what I'm trying to tell you if we want to make things easy to understand, what we have to do is describe what we see. And we have to use words so that they mean the same thing to everybody. So when I tell you the chambers connect with one another, the ventricles connect with the arterial trunks, that is telling you how the blood goes round. And I firmly believe now that what we are trying to communicate is much better achieved by description rather than codification, particularly when we have arcane terminologies such as isolated infundibular discordance, which doesn't mean much to anybody.